We want, oh. we. Well, you gotta clap. Yeah, I clap. <laughs> you clap, you clap. We want, we, we want, want representation. We want, we want, want representation. representation. All right, you're watching the zoo. Uh, we're gonna be talking about representation today. Yes. We're gonna be talking about the people that we talked to. Mm -hmm. Who'd you talk to? I talked to the actress that plays Susie Quintanilla in the Netflix series Selena. It's coming up in December. Um, and she's amazing and she's dope. So talk about representation right there. And I talked to a guy named Sien Fue. He's an artist who does oh, ayahuasca. Dope. All right, keep it locked on the zoo. We'll be right back. What's up guys and welcome to the zoo and we're ready to talk about our big deal which is representation. We is Latinos because Latinos are the most disproportionately disproportionately underrepresented group among anybody we're one of the biggest yet, minorities. Or one of the biggest minorities. We're one of the biggest minorities and we make up half of LA. Mm -hmm. And you I sent you a couple articles that I wrote he was that professor that was like, by the way, become informed, and it's like his own book, his own article. Yeah, because I'm writing about representation <laughs> You're a great at the other writer, times. Right? Thank you. Cool. I do. But that's not why I sent you. Okay. I didn't want to send it so hopefully she sees that it's good writing. I sent it because <laughs> here in Los Angeles specifically, there's a gross example of underrepresentation. The LA Times, which represents a city that has over half the population of Latino, yeah, it's big. has not one Latino, forget about Mexican American, not even one Latino on its 14 editor masthead. That's why. Like, what do you think? How does that make you feel as a Mexican American? in LA well I, when I read your articles it was like not one Latino and I'm like okay usually Latinos you know oh there's a they're Mexican or whatever just because we're across the border but like not one Latino like there's so many Latin American countries like not one Costa Rican Nicaraguan I was like that's kind of crazy and I was also wondering I'm like not even half like a quarter like something and then I think you wrote about that towards the end of one of them where like one of the editors was like maybe 0.25 well, no, so, so there's two things just so people don't get confused uh, uh, there's a thing called the masthead which is the leaders of all the different editorial departments okay. right those are 14 the, like, editors. The middle, middles, no? Yeah, and then there's the editorial here, yeah, the middle, middle meadows. Yeah, that, that I got from my Mexican friend Gustavo Arellano, who's a writer who I interviewed for the LA Times. One of the Which only. Which you wrote few, about? Yeah, one of the few writers in the LA Times that had the the nerve, the goal to talk to me about this issue. But there's 14 deep, not one Latino in that mass. And then there's a thing called the editorial board. They're the ones that ah, write okay. the editorial pages. Okay. So these are the people that tell you who to vote for. These are the people that tell you, you know, what what, what laws we should have and what we should think and, and who to endorse. And who there's some type of pool. right and. And there's six of them. So on top of the 14, there's six of them. And there's one woman who's half Mexican in there. So among, actually not six. There's uh, six plus three. There's nine editorial board members. So out of 22 or 23 people, 0.5 is Mexican. It's like, come on, guys. Yeah. You can, like, in all of Latino America. Well, you, what, what, what I feel Mexican. is that the thing is that LA is half Latino or Latinx, mm -hmm, whatever mm -hmm. word you want to use. Um, the, you know, so it's like. But why do you think these people aren't in position of power? Okay, a couple things. Number one, the new owners of the LA Times look into them. I'm not gonna name their names because I don't. I don't want to pit wars between groups. All right, but that, but. What but, are you saying? Yeah. Well, every other minority group is taken care of. Okay. So in the 14 deep editorial board, you have three African Americans, you have four or five Asians. By mm. the way, the, the owners and publishers of the LA Times. I, I don't. I, I hate to do that. I hate to do that because then it's like oh, I'm looking at the other groups, but zero Latinos is like, okay. If you have like an engineering company and you have like three or four positions at the head and you're like guys we can't we can't do diversity we're just gonna pick the best engineers and they all happen to be like whatever uh -huh. okay. fine but when you have a media company whose purpose is to represent the city right. and you have 14 to 22 influential positions you can't put one <laughs> person in there 0.5 <laughs> Wait, so why don't you think these people are in position I also powers? think, I, I don't think Latinos speak up enough. Okay. Look, I do I'm, think that's a point. I know it's class, like class consciousness. No? Well, well I, I, like I, I, think, I think I think especially in the city, it's mostly Mexican Americans. I make the example of, I grew up in Miami mm -hmm. and Cubans are not humble. And when you go to Miami, Cubans, man, they complained and, and, they, and they, they, you know, they made their point until they got the inclusion. When mm -hmm. you go to Miami, um, you know, there's a lot of Cuban inclusion in the media that okay. covers them. The, the, the Miami Herald, there's a lot of editors. And, and Gustavo Arellano, the Mexican-American writer who I spoke to, said, yeah, we should take a page off of that. I think that here in L.A., you have a lot of Mexicans and Central Americans who are, uh, they're traditionally polite. They don't like to speak mm, up. Yeah, that is an issue in, in the community, right? And so I just think that they haven't made their voice uh, uh, known. And the other thing is, is I just don't think that the L.A. Times has prioritized Latinos because we don't complain as much. Mm. So you think that's what we need? Maybe not complain, but just like- Complain is a bad word. Pound the pavement. Make awareness. Like get up to the neck. 
Make awareness. Oh my God, I thought that was smoke over there. Okay. Um, smoke by the, the way, we're, we're at Running Canyon. We're in Hollywood. The wild, wild yeah. west. We wanted to get out. You know, we had a lot of great response to the Venice Beach episode that we did. Oh, did we? Okay, cool. Um, and that was so, fun. yeah, we want to get back out there a little bit. And we went to Hollywood you Boulevard, it but it was crowded. I think people enjoy the fact that they get to see like other places right. in LA. You know, we're kind of like, well. This is us in our environment. Okay, we're the zoo animals, but we're uncaged because I don't we're believe in caged animals. So if zoos were like loose animals, then I'd believe in the zoo. Mm, okay. But our show is called the zoo. Anyway, so what do you, what do you oh, what do you think about when you look at like major media news and you don't see as many, you know, Latinas that represent someone like yourself? Even though there's plenty of people like you, yeah, there's plenty of Mexican American Latina out there. Why why don't we see more of you on NBC, NBC, CBS, ABC? You know. Um, I do think it's kind of like a problem. <laughs> you have like all these muscles. I, I bet I do too. <laughs> That's like, fine. It's too <laughs> It's also like the hottest day in LA today. Okay, anyways. Um, when you asked me that question, I mean, I don't consider myself a millennial, but honestly, I don't watch like CNN Are Live you Gen Z? Like, I don't, I think I'm on the cusp. Yeah. Yeah. So point is, um, yeah, I don't really have cable TV, so I don't watch these. So like how reputable is like CNN well, and all of that? I get on like, I go online. Okay, but when you go online and you read stories, do you, like, as I do this all the time, oh, do you, do you ever read the byline? No. Okay, start I reading don't. the byline and see how I often you see a Spanish to, yeah, surname, you know? Actually, yeah. And, uh, but but do you, when you look at media and entertainment today, Forget about if you're noticing who's saying the news or who's writing who's the writing news. It, yeah. Do you feel that there is a lack of what we know, our our our, our heritage, our Latin mm-hmm. flavor? Do, do you see a lack of that? Uh, yeah, I do think so. You know, you don't, you know, you don't see a column that talks about like a day in our life or something that you're like, oh, I remember that. Like that hits a note from like me being raised or like things that used to happen when I was growing yeah. up. You know. You know what the other issue is? Because I noticed in the responses to the stories that I wrote for LATV.com. Um, oh, what were those responses? Uh, 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 well, a lot of first of all, a lot of Latinos. By not the way, liking the fact. Umberto Vida, okay? Search that name. Oh, yeah. LATV.com. Exactly. Thank right. you. So, and, and, and when we posted the articles on Facebook, we had actually had a lot of negative reaction from Latinos who, first of all, reacted to me using the word Latinx, which uh, uh, that's another. Co- we'll, what? Do, no, no, we'll do that another day. I'm like, well, there's a bigger point that I'm okay, trying to well, make. Okay, what was the other comment? And, the, and the, uh, well, other people are like, oh, um, you know, somebody shouldn't use um, their, her- their, their heritage or their race just to get a position. And I, I but, do have that question, too, okay. though. I did want to talk to you but, about but that. But I agree with that. But, but the thing is this. In the case of the media, okay, fine, there's some companies that you're just looking for a very objective, cold, calculated measurement of what you want in the position. And if mm-hmm. maybe you don't get, you know. What a, is it? Cultural competency is not as. But if you're big. in a media company, if you're in a newspaper that covers that a city that's cult- half Latino, that's, that drives that, that's, the culture. The purpose of the company is to cover the city. Right. So at that point, you have to have representation. And I'm not true. saying that it has to be exactly proportional to exactly the way the population is, but you have 14 positions. Yeah. And you definitely. couldn't find one position for the people that make up. 50% of the population, Definitely. to me, that is blatant. See, when, when people, uh, with the whole affirmative action thing with the propositions, mm-hmm. I've, I felt some type of way about it. Obviously, I did more research, but it was like, I don't want them to look negatively at us because a Latino. But I no, agree with that. This is looking positively at us because of maybe where we come I, from, I, you know? I agree with that. Uh, here's how I feel about affirmative action. It, you don't need a lot of it, but you do need to make space for maybe a little bit yeah. of it. And the guy from Pinterest, Serena Williams' husband, actually left his position at Pinterest. And I think he was like top, uh, not, maybe not CEO, maybe, but like one of those head positions he left it so that they could put someone a person of color in charge okay. and take his so like there i mean he was a white man that did his part you know hopefully one day I'm, I'm i'm successful enough to where i'm like ah, i've had enough let me leave so that somebody else who's more under privilege than me can have a job right yeah. now i'm keeping my job at LA TV though representation matters you want to read the articles, visit LATV.com. Yeah, Umberto read Vida. our editorial section, man. We got a bunch of hard-hitting articles and a lot Actually, of fun ones, Actually, yeah, too. talking about cultural representation, that's what we Go write about. LATV. <laughs> you know what? Let's continue this after the break, and then uh, we'll, we'll finish this conversation. Plus, I talked to TJ English, who is a white guy, but he wrote about Cuba. He has two books on Cuba that I talked to him about. Oh. Uh, really amazing stuff, Havana and, and all that Cuban. stuff. And you're Cuban. I am Cuban. So, all right. And you're a Mexican-American, I like to say, and you're watching the zoo. Keep it locked. So coming up, I talked to the author, this guy named TJ English. He's written two books on Cuba, one called Havana Nocturne, which is about how the mob Nocturne. tried to take over Havana in the 50s. Oh, yeah, If you yeah, watch Godfather 2, 
they talk about That's that. Dope. And number two, he just came out with a new one called The Corporation. It talks about how when Cuban refugees came here in the 70s, they shredded a mob called The Corporation. Okay. And they had like an underground lottery that they That's made all their wild. money off. And you in the city of New Jersey and here. So I got to talk to them about that. They're okay. going to make a movie. Leonardo DiCaprio is going to probably produce it. On the first one or on the second one? On the second one, the one about the mob here called okay. The Corporation. That's Benito del Toro is attached. Well, because, you know, when I went to Cuba in Havana, they actually still have those casinos. Yeah. Like, I walked into the casinos and it's like, you could tell there was big money out in the island, yeah. you know, like in the 50s and 60s. Well, were the casinos, because I, I went to Havana too. I didn't go into the casinos, but are they, are they still letting people bet? No, 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 you can't, no, you can't, yeah. you can't gamble. Yeah. Well, they're like, what are you talking about? This is, that's like the antithesis the, of communism. The casinos are there, the decoration is preserved. Like, you walk in there and you get a feeling for what the scene was so like. So what happened is the Italian mob, if you watch Godfather 2, like, remember how he yeah. goes to Cuba? That, that's based on true events. So the Italian mob in the wow. 40s and 50s went to Havana and started running the casinos. Now, when Castro took over, one of the first things he did is they yeah, kicked them, cut th the them out. out. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so that, that was a huge thing. So anyway, I got to talk to the, uh, you know, the author about the corporation, and it's coming up right here. Check it out. PJ English, one of, one of my favorite authors. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to hear. Um, so I definitely want to talk about the, the new book, The Corporation, um, about the Cuban underworld, uh, focusing on, on the bolita. A lot of people don't know what that is, little ball. It's Cuban lottery. But before we get to that, I, I want to know what drew you to writing about um, Cuban history and the Cuban underworld to begin with? Well, I was born in late uh, the late 50s. And so I was a child in the 60s when... Uh, Fidel Castro and the relationship between Cuba and the United States was a dominant story on a daily basis in the United States. You would see it on the TV news over dinner at night. And, and I became fascinated with this history, particularly Castro, of course, because he was a young guy who had taken over a country and now he was, for reasons I didn't fully understand, the enemy of the United States. And so this stayed with me. It was just part of my childhood. It was a subject matter that I always had an interest in based on that. And then eventually I became a crime writer and I started writing about organized crime in the United States. And this led me back to the subject of Cuba. This was something that I'd had the interest in. And I, I knew that there had been this era that the mafia had established a base in Havana in the 1950s. So it was kind of uh, logical for me to put these two things together. Let's go ahead and start with the corporation because that's that's the latest one and that's the one yeah. that's creating buzz in Hollywood because um, film rights are involved and I know Leonardo DiCaprio signed on to produce it. A friend of mine, J.D. Frejas, who I've had on my show, is yeah. working with you as a producer. Yes, sir. Um, so tell me what that's about, because that's that's more about the Cuban underworld as it uh, formed here in the United States, right? Exactly, yes. That, in many ways, is a story of what happened after the mafia got chased out of Cuba in 1959, and they established a criminal underworld in the United States. The story begins with the Bay of Pigs invasion, because that was the first and most dramatic attempt by anti-Castro forces to take back Cuba. Uh, it was a disaster by all accounts. Um, Castro knew that the brigade was coming and he was ready for them. And many of them got killed and others were held in prison for the next two years until the United States government could negotiate their release. So um, as you may know, that generation had a very strong sense of venganza, revenge. They wanted revenge um, for Castro taking the country, but also the humiliation of the Bay of Pigs invasion. And so an, under, an underground movement began that was in some ways political, but where it became criminal is with a man by the name of Jose Miguel Battle, who had been a member of the brigade. Um, and when he came to the United States, he formed um, a criminal operation around um, the idea of Bolita, a form of the lottery that was illegal and highly profitable for those who organized it and highly popular with the people. I mean, everyone bet the number. And it became a, a major uh, criminal operation. I mean, Battle was making millions and millions of dollars on a daily basis from this operation. And it involved a lot of Cubans who got involved in it as numbers, runners, members of the organization. It was always amazing to me that um, a lot of these immigrants and refugees many um, who were men of modest formal education, but they had the wherewithal to put together this very sophisticated business 
that was highly profitable and ultimately quite violent because as it became more and more lucrative for those involved in it, greed set in. And this resulted in rivalries, people stealing from the organization, and battle was ruthless. He enforced uh, discipline with, a, with an iron hand. So there were a lot of killings and that's what eventually put him on the map uh, of American law enforcement. Well, you know, I think it's 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 pretty cool, um, you know, as as a Cuban Cuban American to see, you know, an Anglo man to find, you know, Cuban history captivating. I think that with you know the Latin community in the United States, because uh, we come from from countries that speak Spanish, when we're trying to translate our stories, it's it's we we have that gap to fill, right? And and um, for someone like yourself to kind of bring these stories, and and especially with Cuba. Um, for people in this country to realize how intertwined American and Cuban history are. And I, I think yeah. it's, it's very cool. So, so I think that you're doing an awesome job of, of, of kind of like trying to help us bridge, bridge that gap so that, you know, American audiences can start tapping into Latin American stories and for me specifically Cuban stories because I feel there's, there's, a, there's a treasure trove there. Absolutely. Well, let me say something about that. You know, the, the Cuban story in particular, I think a lot of that has to do with the revolution and the nature of the revolution. And the revolution was a controversial event that created a kind of a, it politicized Cuban history, recent Cuban history. And so a lot of Cuban stories have been repressed or swept under the rug, or they're too political to talk about, or they're too loaded with emotion to talk about. And so there are tons of great stories of the Cuban experience yet to be told. And I hope Cubans, and Latinos and anyone who's excited to tell these stories will tell these stories. DJ, thank you so much. Uh, but I want people, you know, to go out, get the corporation, uh, get Havana Nocturne, so you can find out, you know, the real good stuff. And um, good luck to you as far as getting this to Hollywood. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, DJ. All right, guys, keep it locked because after the break, we talk to Lots. Spanish artist Okuda. great street art and he makes big big pieces and they always look new okay okuda all right so he's a Fresh guy named artist. san his real name is san miguel and he added <laughs> so, okuda some long name <laughs> yeah i'm missing something here but you'll find out during the interview in the lower third i'm sure but he's really cool because he works with like geometric shapes okay really bright colors and he's also a sculpture oh wow um you know i always i love interviewing artists especially like people that, sh that started in street art because he went from street art now he's kind of like you know fine art established art. but i always want to find out what they're what <laughs> to, they're to be found in a museum somewhere <laughs> yeah yeah soon to be okay. but i always want to find out how they get to their art you know what i'm saying like i always did he ask, talk about how he does the geometric yeah, figures and stuff? He, he, he did he did and i'm like are you good at math and stuff yeah, like that yeah i was gonna say but he he, you're gonna see he's a character i still don't really understand but maybe you guys will understand Man. where okuda's art comes from somewhere in his mind <laughs> somewhere in the world you know what he also taught he also comes from the madrid scene right now there's a beautiful oh, street I art heard, scene yeah, in madrid yeah, like there's a lot of murals mm -hmm. and stuff like that and when i go back home to miami uh they have art basil in december okay and his art is always centerpieces like, oh so, dude that's so yeah, how so old is a big he thing. i'm not sure is he young though um, he has to be at least in his 30s. He's not oh, very okay. new, so. I mean, still pretty young art yeah. artist, you know, yeah. Rock and roll. Dope. Oh, cool. Let's see what you got, man. You know, I'm familiar with your art for several years now. Going to Miami, where I'm originally from for Art Basel many years, I discovered your art. You know, you did an exhibition there a few years ago, and then the past few years, your art is like in, in a bunch of different exhibitions you probably don't even know about, but you go down to Art Basel, you're all over Winwood. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's not like what do you so how how what do you attribute to this explosion you've had the past few years becoming such a recognizable artist? I think uh, because I didn't stop working, didn't stop traveling, uh, growing up like artists, uh, growing up um, my team, uh, we are around twenty in my team now. Um, yeah, we're moving now to a bigger studio, but uh, that we are in construction now. Uh, maybe it will be for next year in February. Yeah, I think it's like a um, grow up, uh, general grow up, you know? <laughs> yeah. How's everything in Spain right now? Is everything getting good with the, with the, the COVID numbers in that situation? Yeah, I think it's coming back uh, like March, like the, yeah, maybe Madrid and Barcelona are the worst uh, places. Me, I am now in Berlin visiting some friends because I was last year in a film festival painting a big building. 
uh, in Oldenburg, and that's why I, I come uh, to Berlin to visit some friends, some artist friends. And yeah, I will come back tomorrow to Madrid. I stay for a few days, but I am go to the north to my born city to uh, my parents' house because it's quiet place. I and COVID is not too bad, you know. It's it's better. It's it's in Santander, dead, right? Yeah, yeah. So I actually found out that my a part of my family comes from Santander. Yeah. I'm from I'm Cuban. Oh, yeah. uh, um, what is Santander like? I've been to Madrid. I've been to Barcelona. I never got. Yeah. I never went to the north coast. Santander is a quiet place. A small, a small city uh but the the beach and the coast is one of the most beautiful in in spain because it's more more wild you know like um more rocks and, and super green uh asturias galicia and cantabria uh Santander is from cantabria i think are one of the, the best beaches you know in, in spain for me okay because a part of my family my it does come from santander you and me might yeah. be related let's just i'm just uh -huh. <laughs> okay super, um, super. Uh, okay, so so people people see your art, uh, uh, especially the past few years, you're seeing it more and more on buildings around the world. You know, not just your yes. art pieces, but you have these big murals and these big projects that are in public spaces. For people that are just seeing your art now for the first time, describe it. How do you how do you get to this place where you're painting big buildings and describe the the geometric um, signature that you have to your art? Yeah, I think um, I start to do like the, the geometry and this. Uh, a special language. Uh, yeah, I start to, to do my own language and my like the digital geometry skins uh, around 2008. I start to, to paint uh, like uh, gray bodies inside like uh, strange architectures like uh, uh, like I did with triangles and after that I discovered that I, I can do everything like with uh, the geometry, you know, like uh, faces, animals, everything, you know. And I start to do it, like to do the interpretation of uh, classic art uh, to to um, to my digital language, you know, it's kind of kind of that. Yeah. At what point did you take it to where you you you, you did such massive pieces, you know, because yes. now you're being you're doing sides of buildings and you're doing you know all these places all over the world, these huge public displays. At what point did you take it from you know doing your art pieces to, to huge pieces. I think I feel more, more comfortable uh, doing huge pieces, you know, because I came from graffiti and from walls, not big walls, you know, but I, I came from using the spray paint uh, starting in art, you know, uh, and I feel super comfortable uh, just um, uh, painting with spray paint. Uh, when I do a canvas or a small sculptures in the studio, I need uh, like a lot of tape, a lot of cutter. It's, it's more, uh, it's it's more easy for me to do huge pieces, you know, because uh, yeah, you use your body like like the yeah to do everything, you know. And when you paint in a small, for me, it's super complicated because you know, imagine if come if I come to um, from doing big buildings, imagine to do uh, pieces like this, you know, it's like a zoom or or or, a, or or my special world, you know. Yeah. Have, have you gotten good at uh, math over the course of your life? Because because of the kind of art that you do, have you gotten good at measuring things and things at angles, or do you just do everything intuitively? No, uh, uh, I do directly everything in walls because uh, I I have the technique the twenty years painting. You know, uh, when you when I I think the most important is to do the compos the first composition and and see um, and do it perfect. Uh, and and to do that, I do, I use like a big stick with a small brush, and with the lift, I try to see always from far away. Uh, start to do a, a few lines and far away again, you know, to see that the scale is, is is good, you know, and the bodies and everything is is good. And I think the most complicated is is to sketch, you know. But I feel comfortable and I. I enjoy a lot when when do that. You know, I, I never project. I do directly always. Thanks for joining me, man. I hope to see you one day Thanks in Arpels or here in LA, man. Uh, yes, I'll send to soon. USA all my positive energy and all my love, and can't wait to be in USA again because I love this country. Awesome. Ciao. Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back with an interview with Noemi from Selena. <laughs> Hi, 
right, so coming up, um, uh, speaking of ancestors, I don't know if that's a segue or not. I'm just, I'm just transitioning. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? I'm, I'm trying to make a peaceful transition between Wait, one subject and the other. I actually have a question that I'm curious about. Yeah. Me. Okay, we're on the zoo, right? We're yeah. zooples. If you could be an animal, what animal would you be? I guess an eagle, so I could fly. Really? Yeah. Right, okay. Or the big American eagle? No, I think more like I think more like a golden American hawk. American-ish. Not a bald eagle, because <laughs> my hair's thinning already. I'd rather be like a golden eagle, like a golden hawk. All right, awesome. What about you? Uh, maybe like an octopus. You're the first person I've ever met. Something that like word. underwater, though, you know, because we ha we don't know what's down there, you know. But we'll, if I was we'll, an octopus, we'll go with octopus. Be my world. So you spoke to someone um, who is a person, not an animal. Yes. And her name is Naomi. Naomi Gonzalez. Naomi. Tell me about her. Yes. So she's actually in the upcoming um, Netflix Selena series, um, and she plays Suset Quintanilla. So she's a super dope being, dude. She had like so much energy, and we were just vibing back and forth. But here's the thing: you're really young, so you don't remember Selena, right? Well, actually, she, I was born March 10th. Okay. And she died that March at the end of the month, I think, 1995. Wow, okay. Yeah, that was in, yeah. So, do, I mean, did you grow up listening to her music? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I your did. whole family? Yeah, of course. Awesome. And it'd be like this person that we would like just hear at family parties and everything. And then I remember being in like middle school and then in high school and then Mac brings out her brand. And like every year, it just seems like she grows. We are here with Noemi Gonzalez. How are you doing, girl? I'm good. How are you? Good. All right. So Noemi Gonzalez, all right, from Hulu's East, Los High, and the taxi collector recently. Your career is looking pretty good right now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my God. Who could believe it? All glory to God. All glory to God. Yes. I love it. Well, let's talk yeah. about the, the upcoming one, right? The upcoming one's yeah. pretty big. Mm -hmm. uh, you play Suzette Quintanilla in Selena's Netflix series coming out on December 4th. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> one more, one more. <laughs> How was that? What was it like, like auditioning for the role? Like, ah, uh, well, the, the auditioning for the role was incredible. I remember the, all the buzz when they were like, you know, Selena, the series is being made, you know, Selena, the series is being made. And I remember I was so impressed that I was able to stay calm and stay centered and be like, you know what? I'm not going to bug my reps because I already know I'm going in that room. Like, I already manifested it. I was like, no, I'm going to go in. I know it. And I just waited and I saw that other people were going in. I was like, my time's coming. My time's coming. I'll be there in a second. I did go in for Selena first and they only wanted to see the first scene. And then I ended up, they ended up requesting the second scene and I was like, okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then ultimately, um, my agent, my manager called me, Yoni's amazing. And he said like, how did it go? And I was like, it was awesome. I feel like I killed it, but like all good. Like, we'll see what happens. And he's like, I see you more as Suzette. Like, I know you, you know, obviously working with him for so many years and knowing what roles I book. And I was like, let's do it. Like, you know, I'll, like, yeah, hell yeah. Like, Suzette's a badass. And so um, I went in for Suzette and I remember the audition was very interesting. It was a fake scene that they had written. Mm. And I had so much family history that I had already known about the Quintanillas. So the way it was written was one way. And I was like, ah, uh, but I, we know the <laughs> dynamics here. So, and I already like can see what I could do with this. And um, I, I did a, a, I feel a good job. So it was, it was an incredible experience audition cast wise to just be going through an experience that was Selena themed, you know, it was just like, I grew up, I, my dreams have come true. <laughs> that is insane because you it's learned insane. how to play the drums after you got casted. Correct. Girl. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I did not know the drums whatsoever. I, um, I, you learned I told... like every song, like multiple songs, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the only two that I can confirm because of the promos is uh, definitely Como La Flor and Biri Biri Bam Bam. Um, so I definitely had to, to learn those two, but I had to start, as soon as I booked it and they're setting me up for my um, lessons with production, I hit the drums twice a day, every day, day and night, um, so that I could make sure that I could get it because originally we had three weeks to shoot. So I had to start learning 50 songs. And <laughs> I was like, okay, I could do it. I swear I could do it. And then um, luckily um, we were delayed in shooting and that worked out for me because I got extra time and making sure I could get to those 50 songs. That's a Latina attitude right there though, that mentality. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm about to do it. <laughs> I'm gonna put on some lipstick too. <laughs> and the hooves. Yeah. 
I love it. I love it. Oh my God. Was this your first time interpreting like a real life person? Did you get to talk to Suzette? Was there like a conversation? Oh girl, I wish. I wish I was able to talk to Suzette. Um, I mean, yes and no. We have we have the family's blessing. They're completely mm -hmm. involved. They um, were wonderful at making sure that we had what we needed in order to do our job. But I think the way to, to make sure that we did it in a way that was maybe less pressure they mm. they they wanted us to be focused on all of us to be focused on our own interpretation with the material that we had which i absolutely love but yeah we 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 have been connected and we've been reaching out although we're not supposed to and it's so <laughs> awesome like we, we like we, we i could tell that we can't help but be like hey girl hey girl and we're like oh, like the first time that she uh reached out i was in the makeup chair and i just started crying i just started crying like i was like <laughs> <laughs> and um the girls took a second in the makeup trailer and they just watched for a second and they're like wow like and i was just like yeah can i have a second and then and then i had to all right let's keep going with the show because we have to film in a second and this didn't happen <laughs> hey. there's weight on your shoulders but it's beautiful that they let y'all just kind of flow in creativity you know and yes. didn't really try to like maneuver every yes. move Yes, absolutely. The the flow of creativity here is real and it's all the way Selena would, would be, you know, trying to do her music, singing in Spanish, singing in English, designing clothes, like that poetry and artistry and creativity is flowing all over set with everyone involved and everyone is connected and everyone wants to give it their all. So the pressure, the poetry, the essence and radiance of Selena is everywhere and it's just a dream come true to be in this kind of energetic bubble as a field mm -hmm. of, of, of creativity. Girl, well, we're so excited because that energy we're talking about, you're passing it on right now. And oh, like, good. So it continues, you know, and it's yeah. just about female empowerment. I love it so mm -hmm. much, girl. Yeah. 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 It's going to be so good. <laughs> Are you excited? I'm excited, girl. We're I'm so cool. excited. I'm a huge fan. I'm, a, I'm very nervous, but I'm a huge fan of, of her and the show, and, and I see the excitement. And so let's let's keep this excitement and this this blast of Selena like hell yeah like we, it's what we needed in 2020. This. We needed this in 2020. We needed this so bad. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully when the whole quarantine pandemic is over, you know, you come into the studio, we would love to talk to you. Um, and best of wishes, girl. Let I love your energy. Thank you so much. You got me into a certain place. It's, it's, it's beautiful. All right, guys. Coming up after the break, it's Skittles Ortega. Oh. Keep it locked. All right, guys, we are back here on the zoo, and this is actually one of my favorite spots to come this during the wild. day, not at night. I was about to say, okay. So this used to be a house in the early eight, 1900s. It was probably built around 1905, 1910, because I've read about this. I've looked it up. Oh, you looked it up? Yeah, okay. and so this used to be a fireplace. You know, these were like the early settlers of like this area when, when this area was a sparse thing, you know, the 1890s, 1905, During 1910. the gold rush? I don't know if they were looking for gold here. I think they were just trying to hide out here, and okay. then it became like a national park. Um, so yeah, what do you think that there's a tree just this going is through crazy. it? Can you imagine like what I like, happened I like here in 1910? About history. Yeah, I like learning about history. You know? Would you ever come here at night though? No, like, you because said you never have. Yeah. But would you? Uh, I mean, I came with other people. Have you ever gone to like uh, an abandoned house or something in the Hollywood Hills, maybe? Are there abandoned houses? Yeah, there are. You are. Yeah. Tell me about them. Yeah, we'll shoot the next zoo. Let's shoot the next zoo. Okay. We're gonna go to an abandoned okay. house. Okay. We're, we're gonna we're gonna totally I'm do that. Down. I'm kind of um, down. No, it's kind of cool. You know, it's 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 sometimes it's used for like you know, probably bad stuff happens here. You know? Yeah, like a, I, yeah, especially out here in the Okay, let's cleanse let's cleanse this with our meditation. One, three okay. seconds. Ready? <laughs> let's do an om. One, two, three. Om. Okay. Okay, don't be embarrassed. A bigger one than that. Ready? One, two, do three. I, do I breathe through my nose and then out through my mouth? No, just do one om because it's, it's or do I air. breathe through my mouth and then just let it out? Well, you gotta go om. One, two, three. Om. om. All right, coming up now, that was good. You, you reached but, it at this frequency, I and know, I reached it. We, I know. We, we, we met all the frequencies. I don't know right? that that's the kind of home that we should be doing when we're trying to meditate, but that's fine. We'll take that one. All right, coming up next, uh, one of our favorite intrepid reporters, next. Dennis Pastorizo, speaks to a guy named Skittles who does voices for cartoons. That's dope. Skittles, welcome to LA TV. How are you, honey? Hi, how are you? I'm good. Tell us briefly about this wonderful character that you're playing on uh, this sci-fi TV show. Yes, so I am playing the character of Debbie. 
Beef with the panda um, and the crew of zoo animals um, from the show Wildlife. If we don't fix the water, Marnie's gonna die. She's dying as we speak. Land money, yeah. She sounds fine to me. Come on, Debbie. Can't you at least just keep an eye on Marnie? Oh. Ugh. I really wish I could, but I promise Billy, he and the boys could practice their nail technique on me. Sorry. Debbie, is this character like pansexual? Is it androgynous? Is it supposed to be a woman, a man? It does, do we, do we get any sort of explanation? I will, I believe that De Debbie, Debbie the character is a girl. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know how I am, so like I'm I'm the truest non-binary individual in the world. So if people see Debbie as a as a as a boy or as a non-binary individual or transgender, I mean, <laughs> more power to it, right? <laughs> nice, nice, nice. You're playing a panda bear, but it skittles into bears in real life. Are we talking about like bears like in the gay community, right? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Like, I don't necessarily have a type, and I could go for bears, but not it, it's not the community that I attract first. Well, as you know, the show that I work with is called The Zoo, and you know, your, your TV show also takes place in a zoo. So yeah. I was wondering if you were down to play the animal game. Are you down? I'm down to play the animal game. Let's play the animal game. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna <laughs> we're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay, I'm gonna randomly select um, a piece of paper. It's gonna have the name of an animal on it, and you're gonna have to act it out. And I'm gonna have to figure out what animal is it. If I get more than half of them right, there are ten animals. Okay. Um, if I get more than half of them right, you have to do the chicken dance. If I don't, I have to do the chicken dance. All right? A la una, a la dos, a la tres, let's begin. Animal number one, I cannot look at it. What, uh, begin. Okay. Did you see uh, it? Bah. <laughs> um, uh, go. Yes. <laughs> okay, ding, 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 you got one, you got one. Okay, let's go for the next one. What is this one? And go. Oh my God, um, Polly want a cracker. <laughs> So stupid. Uh, a parakeet. Um, uh, canary. No, 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 you were, you were, you were, right letters, just wrong type of bird. Uh, a parrot, a parrot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, next one. Go. Okay. A cow, a cow, a cow. <laughs> okay, you got three there. Okay. Uh, next one. And go. Man. <laughs> um, a lion. Mm -mm. Oh, damn. Rawr. That, that's great. That's great. A tiger. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, yay. Okay, how many, how many is that? That's four. That's four. Okay, oh, she's just real. You are getting close to it, honey. Okay, <laughs> next one. What's this one? Go. Ribbit. Ribbit. Oh, that's Ribbit. a frog! <laughs> okay, you got five. If you get this one, that means I have to do the chicken dance. Oh my gosh. Okay. okay. Let me let me try to see if I can dig deep and find a hard one, damn it. Uh hold on. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I found one. Give me a second here. I don't wanna look at it. And go. Woof, woof, woof. <laughs> oh, woof. Woof, woof. woof. A oh, dog. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Before we conclude this interview, I just want to know, Skittles, when did you first taste the rainbow, honey? I first tasted the rainbow when I was about 18 years old. <laughs> a mature, a mature Skittles taster. taster. Mature Skittles taste the rainbow, yes. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, guys, after the break, I talked to Cienfue. Go.
right, guys, we are back on the zoo, and we're here at the famous bench at Ronin Canyon, which you've never been at. I've never been, and I was born and raised in LA. You were born and bred in LA. I could go for some bread. I know you can. <laughs> uh, no, this is like a lot of TV shows, a lot of movies have been filmed here, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty iconic. Cute. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a good hike. All right, now, easy transition into the next toss. Speaking of visions. Ooh. Right? So I interviewed a guy named Xian Fu. He's a rock artist, he's a musician, he's also very psychedelic. Psychedelic. You've seen some of his music I have some seen, of his videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His music videos are just like, it's like a, a complete experience. Visual, auditory, you know? Totally. Well, I talked to him about, like, you know, psychedelics and how he's been influenced by, like, mushrooms and ayahuasca and all that mm -hmm. stuff, and we got really into it, as you know, so check it out. Cien Fue, what's up, my man? Hey, what's up? How are you doing up there in L.A.? I'm doing pretty good. Well, how's everything? So you're in Panama City, right? You're, you're, you're running around Panama City? Yeah, I've been, I had a busy day today running around Panama City, right here uh, next to the Panama Canal, next to a big jungle known as the Soberania National Park. So it's all kinds of tropical critters coming over into the city all day long. Oh, wow. I had, like, yeah, this is part of our whole tropical uh, vibe thing for our music. I've had like snakes in my house. I've had like the, a couple of interviews ago, we had toucans flying overhead. Wow. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. And uh, we're, our sound is Psicodelia Tropical. So it all, it's, all, it's all distilled in there. Well, I, you know, one of the things that's making 2020 livable, despite everything that's going uh, on, is your new album, Life in the Tropics. So, um, you know, you're touching upon Life in the Tropics. Why is it that that was the, the name of the album and the theme for this album? Oh, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Um, we, I had this group of songs in English. It was going to be my first uh, album in English. I had over 80 tracks in Spanish before. And uh, basically, I wanted to kind of reach out to more people and spread our message of just these tropical vibes coming from the Amazon and uh, kind of uh, warming up the lives of everybody up north and uh, trying to get a little bit of the warm tropical energy from down here over to you guys. Explain explain your your, your psychedelic tropical music. You call it Psicodelia Tropical. Explain that to people. Uh -huh. Well, I, I came out of rock and espanol and Latin alternative. Uh, my first album was in 2006. And uh, I, my influences were mostly uh, Latin rock bands like Caifanes, and uh, Soda Stereo, and uh, Robi Draco Rosa, that kind of sound, Latin alternative. And uh, I've been evolving, and this latest album, I had a bunch of songs that are more of an international indie sound. And uh, we're, we're just uh, distilling a lot of different influences from traditional uh, Panamanian guitar and folkloric sounds to cumbia, to salsa, a lot of different Latin influences, but a lot of different like psychedelic rock from the 60s, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. I, my head is like a melting pot, trying to trying to kind of coalesce all of that into, into Psicodelia Tropical, which is uh, tropical vibes with some psychedelia and some ayahuasca inspired uh, messaging also, which is trying to spread positive vibes and get people to understand that they need to uh, live in harmony with nature and appreciate nature. Have you recently done ayahuasca or have you been doing ayahuasca over the past few years that brought you to this part in your creativity where you wanted to do something very psychedelic and very like introspective and-, and Exactly. You know? I've also uh, tried some different ones like psilocybin and LSD and, and I had an ayahuasca experience uh, a couple of years ago when I was in the process of making this album. So it kind of helped me bring together the entire vision for the album and also, the visuals really inspired some of the artwork, some of the psychedelic artwork. Um, I saw some amazing uh, neon kaleidoscope uh, visuals in the jungle at night. And uh, we did it in a big, uh, we did it with a couple of Colombian shamans here uh, in a national park called Cerro Campana, which is uh, Bell Mountain, basically, and it's a big jungle. So we were on the edge of the jungle all night for about 10 hours tripping. And it was a really intense, uh, kind of like a message. I had a really intense experience uh, gazing into a fire also, where I went into the fire. Life in the Tropics, the title track yeah. is amazing. Sunset Sesh, you know, when you were talking about some of your influences from the 60s, I was expecting you to say the name that you sound just like him in the song, which is Carlos Santana. But oh, oh, cool. 
Santana, like 1969 Carlos Santana. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, do, do you, does it make sense to you when, when, when I bring that up? Yeah, that's definitely an influence. Uh, some of my biggest influences uh, are uh, for guitar, for the for the type of guitar language I'm trying to to develop is uh, Santana, the Caifanes guitarist, Markovic, also is a huge influence. He did a, a really interesting translation of mariachi and Mexican guitars to electric guitar for Caifanes. Uh, and I highly recommend the, the classic Caifanes album, El Nervio del Volcán, The Nerve of the Volcano. It's an amazing album for a guitar player that's looking for something similar to Santana. So those yeah. two guys, a couple of Brazilian guys like Gilberto Gil, that also did some kind of Latin stuff on electric guitar. And I'm actually, uh, I studied a lot of traditional Panamanian, uh, like roots Panamanian uh, influences. Uh, in Panama, they call it typical music, like musica tipica. It's going to be time to dance. Uh, yeah. and, and, it, it, and the music easily transitions between rock and dance. Um, listen, man, I, I think it's a great album. Um, I love hearing the backstory. I, I think it's so cool that you are infusing you know, your music with some of the spiritual experiences that you're having, some of the psychedelic experiences. So uh, everyone definitely has to go out and uh, you know get download this album, Life in the Tropics, and, and maybe one day you and me sit in a ceremony together, brother. Yeah, awesome, man.